New data shows demand for antidepressants has surged during the pandemic. The 2021 Antidepressants Global Market Report reveals demand surpassed $26 billion in 2020. The nonprofit group Mental Health America found the number of people looking for help with anxiety and depression increased by 93 percent last year. Seventy percent of those people said loneliness or isolation was the top contributing factor. But as aspects of society slowly start to return to normal, some people are starting to become anxious about re-entering public life. For more on this, I want to bring on Roger, Dr. Roger McIntyre. He is the CEO of AltMed and professor of psychiatry and pharmacology at the University of Toronto. Dr. McIntyre, welcome. Let's first talk about that report on antidepressants. Are you surprised to see such high demand? I'm not surprised to see that. And when we hear about that, I see that as a proxy. That's a proxy not only of a increased demand broadly, but more specifically, what you could assume is, is that's not just depression. That's also due to anxiety, due to sleep, even features of post-traumatic stress or PTSD. And in some cases, they're also prescribed to help people with sleep at night and for eating disorders. So all of these conditions and others are what antidepressants are often prescribed for, sometimes so-called off-label. And so what you're seeing is, is a proxy, a, a metric that maps on to what other surveys have shown, that the population has gone through an unprecedented level of population distress. What are the guidelines here for antidepressant use? And are you concerned at all about the amount of medications being prescribed during this pandemic? Well, for me, I look at it from different perspectives. You know, just recently, we were all very pleased to see that between March of 2020 and March of 2021, there was a 5% overall decrease in the nationwide reporting of suicide rates. When we begin to look at this in a bit more detail, there's a hint, there's a suggestion that maybe some of the states like Connecticut and Illinois may have had a slight increase, especially in African-American populations. So these data tell us that we're going in the right direction, but we have a long way to go. How does that come back to the topic of antidepressants? Well, 80% of people who die by suicide have a diagnosis of major depressive disorder, which is a very serious, very uh, disabling, and obviously very lethal condition for those affected. For me, I would certainly agree with the thesis or the, really the, the notion that we clearly don't want people to be on plenty of, of psychiatric medications. No one would make such a claim. But we also don't want these people to be suffering. And when you look across the country, uh, doesn't matter what state we're talking about, the evidence still does indicate that the majority of people who have a serious mental illness, in many cases chronic mental illness, are not receiving the care, the care that we consider what we call minimally adequate according to best practices or so-called clinical practice guidelines. So I think we need to look at the broader context. So I think what we're really talking about is we need to find ways to narrow the gap, the gap between those who really need treatments like this and those who are getting them because that gap does not seem to be as narrow as it should be. I also want to ask you, doctor, about something we're hearing about. Some people are anxious about having to leave social isolation soon. They worry about post-pandemic crowds and social interactions. What is your advice for people who may be struggling with that? Well, I think that the advice in terms of just practical advice would be we don't need to go from zero to 100 overnight. You can take this in bits and pieces with a gradual re-entry, if you will, into the so-called normal environment or going back to brick and mortar work settings and what have you. So let's take it in pieces. Let's take it in kind of piecemeal fashion. The other aspect is, is that many companies, many employers broadly, not just in the private but public sector, are increasingly sensitive to this issue and are doing their best to offer accommodation, various versions of hybrid models, and we certainly welcome that type of program for people. I also think that people need to keep in mind that this is in fact now in its final stages, which is a remarkable thing. 
What I've described during the past 13, 14 months is that this has not just been a public health crisis, this has been a mental health crisis, an economic crisis, and throughout this, we've had malignant, unpredictable stress. We don't know when this is going to end. And I suspect for some mm -hmm. people, part of the stress with going back will be this underlying uncertainty. Is this just temporary? You see, it's very hard for us to accommodate to the new normal if the new normal is back to normal, if we don't really trust that this new back to normal is going to sustain itself. And we've been hearing somewhat mixed messages about what might happen in the fall. But I think what people need to recognize is that this looks as though we're going to have the virus around for some time, more as a kind of local endemic kind of thing. But it does not appear to be the case that the economy is going to require massive shutdowns in the future. So we need to stick with what works, bringing structure and organization to our life, the usual thing with diet and exercise and keep connected, all of that. But one needs to recognize that for the last 14 months approximately, we have received messages that have been inconsistent. And I think there's not just a low level of trust. In fact, if you read the Pew Research Institute's report about six months ago, Americans are reporting from the lowest levels of trust they have in their neighbor and in public officials, along with some of the mixed messages, often contradictory messages that have come out have only fostered more mistrust in what they're hearing. So a combination of factors, things that we can do that are practical, but I think there's a good reason to believe, given the incredible vaccine rollout and given the high uh, rates of people who are getting the vaccine, uh, I think we have a, a high level of confidence that we are now in the final stages. All right, Dr. Roger McIntyre for us. Doctor, thank you very much for your insight. We really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me.